Good afternoon. Okay, welcome and thank you to everybody for joining us for another episode of the Jane Irrigation Training Series. I'm Richard Rastusha, Vice President of Water Management Solutions for Jane Irrigation. And today we're going to be talking about what I think is a really important crop uh, for the, uh, for the, that we're going to see a lot of interest in in the future. We're already seeing a lot of interest in hemp uh, that we haven't seen before, but uh, a couple things are really interesting about this crop. And one is uh, there's no long history of growers of hemp that we can go back to or rely on to provide a lot of good information about hemp. And so uh, as a result, uh, we're seeing a lot of failures in the, in the hemp area. So, so that's one thing. And two, uh, just the popularity of hemp and growing hemp has, uh, has really accelerated lately. I think what has happened is we do see a lot of failures uh, we do see people say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm making $100,000 an acre growing hemp. And as a result, you know, uh, people like me are looking at their side yard thinking, how much hemp could I grow there? Uh, I might be able to make some money there. So uh, people are really uh, uh, entering into a marketplace that uh, maybe don't have the experience or, or knowledge. So uh, what we're trying to do today or what we will do today is uh, for all of you that are uh, growing hemp, thinking about growing hemp or attempting it, uh, we're going to give you some good solid irrigation ideas uh, for hemp. And taking us through this uh, uh, journey today is going to be Michael Derwenko, somebody I've worked with at, um, at Jane now for almost seven years, and we worked together at Valley Crest uh, before that. And what's interesting about Michael is many things, right? He's a former contractor. Uh, he's been uh, uh, great for customer service and customer support throughout his, his time. And then, uh, oh, about six years ago, seven years ago, he really started to take an interest in the uh, hemp and cannabis industry and really started traveling the nation, looking at uh, uh, lots of hemp grows and indoor cannabis grows. And as a result, he's one of the few people that actually have a really good knowledge of what's happening out there in the uh, hemp and cannabis world. So uh, with that, I want to say uh, welcome, Michael. Uh, how are you today? Oh, thank you, Richard. Um, I'm good. Yeah, it's actually ironic that you say that we don't have much history of hemp growing, but um, you know, I, I, I would say that we don't have as much history um, with irrigation. Uh, they used to just flood water it and use buckets. So while the country and the world has been growing hemp for a while, I don't think our knowledge of irrigation um, to, you know, to do it uh, conservatively has been, uh, has been assessed like it has the last few years. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I, I think uh, hemp, I think uh, cannabis, both are uh, kind of a thirsty crop. Uh, not, not the thirstiest, but uh, definitely uh, thirsty. And uh, uh, I think uh, water for both of these is, is uh, continues to be an issue, right? It does. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> you know, hemp is a, it can be a fickle crop when you're growing into the northern part of the country. And then when you're growing in the southern part, uh, it's kind of the same thing where too much heat, too much coolness or cold uh, can lead to different issues. And so you have to be willing to adapt with your irrigation practices. And uh, so not only the distribution of the water, but when you're watering and how long you're watering for, uh, you know, changes substantially from region to region. Yeah. So Michael, you've been uh, coast to coast, right? Uh, started in California on this, you're in Florida now, and you've seen a lot of hemp grows all in between. Um, the majority of growers out there, are they uh, experiencing something else and are shifting their crop to hemp? Or is it uh, mostly new people getting into uh, hemp and trying to figure out how to do it? Um, so it's a, it's a combination of a couple of things that we have a lot of retrofits or, you know, conversions from existing crops over to hemp, um, very similar to corn and soy, you know, in the Midwest, um, you know, at the same time, you have to be careful because certain crops are very, you know, they're evasive, they suck the nutrients out of the soil. And so, uh, to go in with the, a new crop, you know, isn't always advantageous because, uh, there might not be any nutrients and then you have to weigh out the, uh, you know, your essentially your, your re return on investment. Do we have time to, you know, till down three feet to, um, you know, add what we need to, to the soil, to amend the soil, to make it um, something that hemp can grow in. Uh, so I'm, I know that they have this problem with a lot of conversion crops. Uh, so you have that sometimes. We have a Christmas tree farm up in upstate New York that I'm working with now at 600 acres. They've been growing Christmas trees for over a hundred years and they want to convert to hemp. So, you know, the, those roots had really just kind of uh, 
degraded the, the quality of the soil. And so while, while they're thinking, well, we'll just plant them in between where the Christmas trees used to grow. Um, I'm trying to explain like, look, when we go down 24 inches, you have nothing in your soil. So uh, then you have to weigh out, well, if we have 15 acres and we're trying to amend the soil and add soil and nutrients to it, how much is that gonna cost us before we can even plant our plants? So you have all these things that people don't really take into, take into consideration. Um, and so while it does kind of grow, you know, there's a reason it's called a weed, you know, it does grow very much like a weed. Once you get it growing and you get it past a certain point, it will take off. Um, you still have to establish the, uh, the lower infrastructure into the soil base that you have to with any crop. So, yeah, those are really good points, Michael. And one thing that I, that, that I know you've done, um, and it's been a challenge, right. To get uh, people to understand about, uh, hemp irrigation. Uh, so, uh, I think a few months ago, you were uh, generous enough to put together a hemp irrigation system guide. And uh, this is, I think the design is a, a attempt uh, to help people understand what they need to do to actually grow hemp successfully from a uh, irrigation standpoint. Yeah, um, so coming from landscaping, you know, um, uh, it's really hard when it's 90 degrees out to read, you know, 140 page manual on how to install, you know, overhead irrigation or drip irrigation. And I always thought, um, you know, from, from my marketing history or um, I always thought that people, they wanted the, they want, you want the, as a contractor or distributor, you want the information you need, but you don't want it, um, you know, it to, it to be a cumbersome process to, to look up and reference these things. And so what we did was instead of creating this 50 or 80 page document, that's everything you need to know um, from genome splicing to, um, you know, very, very complex versions of, you know, ROI and whatnot, um, or excuse me, of, of, you know, taking the saline and whatnot out of your, of your water. Um, we kind of did a condensed version where maybe it's everything you need to know or take into consideration up front before you consider converting your crop over to hemp uh, or before you even consider growing hemp at all, because it, like any crop, does have, uh, have a lot of ins and outs that you need to know before you even start the project. And then obviously from a manufacturer standpoint, we want to make sure that uh, specifying and choosing the products you need uh, to get the, the crop that you want isn't overwhelming as well. And so we hope this guide, you know, is about 20 pages long, 25 pages long. Of course, it could be longer, it could be shorter. Um, in my travels, as you mentioned over the last uh, between six and seven years across the country, the, I tried to answer a lot of the most popular questions that I get when I visit a site. Um, and as you know, these are sites that I will fly into, visit for an hour and then fly out of. But while I'm there, gain the knowledge um, that I'm ne the next site I visit, I know exactly where they need to be and what they need to avoid. So they're not like dealing with the same challenges that the previous site dealt with. So we tried to kind of encapsulate it into this, this document that we, uh, we call our hemp irrigation design guide. Yeah, and for everybody watching, I'm putting that uh, a link to the uh, guide in the chat right now. Uh, so that they can easily access it uh, you know, after um, if they want. Uh, I also want to remind everybody that the chat and the Q&A are both open uh, if you have questions uh, as we go through the guide. So uh, I think that's what Michael's going to do now is going to take us through the guide. And, you know, uh, every guide uh, has an author, has illustrations, but uh, what's really great is the opportunity to uh, hear from the author. Uh, this is how I would use the guide uh, and I think this uh, becomes a much more powerful tool as a result of that. Yeah, um, yeah, this will, this will essentially be the, the cliff notes to it. This is how I approach a site. This is how I approach, um, you know, uh, talking to distributors and providing support to contractors and new growers. Um, and, you know, you, you, you'll, everyone will more than likely see voids if they're professionals at this. And then you'll also feel like we're maybe getting a little too detailed. And so I thought maybe just running through it um, you know, for the podcast uh, listeners and for the, the viewers, maybe when they look at it, it doesn't, it's not as overwhelming to them. And then, you know, even from a sales support standpoint, uh, our internal Jane team members and our distributor, distributing partners can look at this and then they know what questions to ask of their growers, because they're going to be getting this walk in a lot more um, these days. And they, they really need to know uh, what are the right questions to ask them and what's the right information to get from them to, uh, to approach someone like us, the manufacturer. Yeah. All right, so yeah, please please ask questions as, as you will. Um, I'll try to answer everything the best I can. If I can't do it, I'll get back to you after the webinar. Um, 
but uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and open this up if you're ready, Richard. Yeah, that'd be great. So I'm okay, looking perfect. at this first illustration about uh, uh, the uh, legal or not legal, and uh, boy, what a uh, uh, what a, uh, a fast changing environment that is, right? Yeah, it's probably changed since I made this last year too. Um, you know, we I think at this point we have 28 states where it's uh, where it's essentially legal across the board for even recreation, um, and so it's for cannabis. So it, it it's growing quickly. Um, you know, some of the things we like to point out, um, you know, the difference in cannabis and hemp is, is essentially the THC level. Um, you know, anything, I believe it's 0 0.03 or less uh, is viewed as hemp, which means they're typically using it for anything from fabrics to um, CBD oil, uh, which is going to be, you know, it's not going to have the, uh, the, the lucid state attached to it that a lot of the THC um, products are going to have. This is what you know the founding fathers were growing to to make um, army fatigues out of and whatnot. It's a very strong, durable fabric. Um, I don't know how many people in the United States are using it for that right now. Um, you'd have to grow a lot of it, and it would really have to take over um, a lot of the, uh, the the fertile land that we use to grow our ethanol or our corn. Um, and I think slowly that will happen because it it is. It grows a lot healthier and you don't need the nutrients to potentially pollute, you know, our Mississippi Delta and whatnot. Um, and so I think a lot of people will be focusing uh, more and more on him. And, you know, it helps when the spread is consistent across the country, especially from like a national uh, manufacturer like ourselves or giant dist distribution networks. Um, it makes it uh, way more beneficial to them to have a grower market from, a, from coast to coast that they can support as opposed to an individual state. Yeah, I'll do a plug uh, for the hemp industry right now. I put hemp seeds, a very high uh, source of protein on my uh, breakfast fruit in the morning. It's, uh, it livens up the flavor and it's a great source of protein. Uh, you could, there's whole books on, on the benefits of hemp. I mean, hemp, hemp is, it's an incredible crop. Um, I, w I honestly wish I knew more about the actual plant um, and the uses of it because there's so many that it's just a rabbit hole. Um, but every time I visit a different farm and meet with the grower, uh, it's just enlightening to know that there's all these, it's such a multi-purpose plant. So, so yeah, um, as you can see here, I, I've noted exactly where, uh, the legal, legal medicinal use is, where the THC is limited, which it means you can only grow hemp there, um, where it's prohibited completely. Um, and then ultimately where it's decriminalized, which means as long as you're not driving in, in, under the influence of any kind of THC or CBD, uh, it is legal to, to use and possess. And so um, we still have some, uh, you know, some growth and some progression that needs to be made um, in these different states. But, you know, when you have a state like California that has, what is California, 65 million people at this point. Um, and then you have somewhere like Delaware that probably has like 1.2 million people. Uh, it, it, it's, it can be really challenging to, to spread the word and, and get everybody to do things properly uh, with such a huge population. And so I know some of the challenges. And then I remember right before I left California, uh, the governor, Gavin Newsom, had, um, you know, he put $100 million into the, uh, the cannabis market um, simply because what they were doing is they were almost being over more overbearing than they needed to when it came to the distribution of the cannabis. And so um, the local governments had made it very difficult um, to distribute the cannabis that the government had backed to grow. And so there was this stifling process where, uh, you know, they had made it legal, everybody had converted over their businesses and they had tried to be progressive in their, in their thoughts and growing it, but then they couldn't distribute it because of a lot of local governments. And so um, some of the, the concerns from the local governments um, that stifled the process, uh, Gavin Newsom wrote a check for $100 million and, and tried to help that. So I know the state of California personally is um, hoping, hoping to open up the floodgates a little and be able to distribute all the cannabis they're growing. Um, and so that's just like the perfect example of how you have a state government, a local government that need to really work together and be on the same page as far as, you know, growing it, le uh, permitting it, legalizing it, and then distributing it um, while taking into account you don't want um, you know, a shop right next to a school or a library or something like that. So, so there's a lot of things, a lot of ins and outs that go into this. And uh, California is a perfect example of how you do it with 65 million people. Yeah. All right. 
Um, so as I mentioned, um, I put the definition by the USDA in here. They are the governing body of hemp and THC in this country. Uh, they oversee it uh, from a federal level the different um, aspects of legality. Obviously there's still very little, if no interstate commerce that exists in hemp and cannabis, everything needs to stay local. Um, you know, I, I've a, I'm a firm believer in local government. And so I, I like the idea of tax dollars coming in towards education for local government, um, as opposed to, to going to, um, to federal aid. Uh, everybody has obviously their difference of opinions on that, but that's one thing that still stays consistent is, that there are only a couple states and a couple growers uh, that can move anything across state lines. Usually it's in the form of an extracted product like an oil and it's typically for uh, terminally ill cancer patients. Um, and that's about it. But besides that, whatever you're growing or making, you need to be able to distribute it where you're at. Um, the hemp side of it is a little bit different. There is some interstate commerce related to it. Uh, this again is a 50 page document in the, in the guide. So you could read into it and find out all the logistical challenges you have to moving hemp around the country from state to state. Uh, you probably know more about it than I do if you're reading that book, because I've never had to be concerned with it. Um, but yeah, I think that is also one of the major things that comes into place when you think about that ROI is, you know, how much money and what is the demand locally for this product? Um, even in California, when you have such huge growers of cannabis, um, you know, ultimately they are having to own the distribution network as well. They're owning the retail distribution to be able to control the amount of supply and demand. And that's where I think, um, you know, a lot of the cannabis, cannabis guys in particular, um, you know, in the last 25 to 30 years, we're doing maybe something illegally and now they're able to do it legally. And so jumping through the, the hoops is, um, is a, is a challenging process to say the least. Um, not to mention a lot of the uh, permitting dollars that the government currently needs are substantial. Um, they require constant, uh, constant funds to stay up to speed. And I think a lot of growers uh, don't like paying them <laughs> in so many words. So, um, and with the hemp thing, it's very similar. Um, you know, like we're just in Oregon and Oregon doesn't want to see it from a highway. So if it's, if it's wider than two lanes, they don't want to see it. They don't want to smell it. Um, you know, so they hide it back in the valleys. It needs to be a certain, a certain distance off the roads. Um, you know, if it, if Northern California and Humboldt, they prefer hoop houses, you know, so you can't see it. Um, they don't want kids on school trips asking questions of their parents that they probably can't answer yet. So it, it's just, there's still, there's still some hurdles to jump through. Uh, but if you're serious about it, it's, it's nothing that any grower in this country can't, can't take care of. Mike, I was looking at this uh, guide with uh, somebody um, uh, months ago, and this photo on the right, they said, gee, that doesn't look like a very healthy uh, hemp plant. And um, so I, I wanted you to tell us why that, uh, that photo is in there. Um, so the reason I put that in there is just that reason, because um, I think everybody is under the impression that, that when they're used to seeing cannabis inside or they're seeing it in hoop houses or in a controlled environment, that everything, the canopy is very consistent, everything, um, you know, all, all, everything on it is very consistent and it's very well grown. Well, the majority of hemp you see looks more like this. If it even has like uh, the buds or the colons on it, it basically it typically just looks like a leafy bush. And so this, this particular plant is in um, either Southern Washington or Northern Oregon, um, but this crop's been around for three or four years and they're one of the larger hemp providers in the area. And they're, they're, what they're doing is they're taking the better looking um, you know, colas off of it and they're selling that for the THC and then they're able to use the rest of the plant for a low THC level for a hemp or for edibles and whatnot. Um, so they don't really, need it to look good in so many words. They're looking for potency um, in the leaves and the stems, and they're not necessarily looking for, you know, uh, the buds to be like these beautiful flowers. It just, it doesn't work like that in a lot of, uh, a lot of areas. By the time that product is grinded up and trimmed up and delivered as the final product, um, nobody's really concerned what the plant itself look like. Um, another problem with that is it's also been recently, um, they've gone through and trimmed a lot of it out. And so 
it it's a lot of different species from purple stuff to green stuff you know that's not the scientific term but all their different species are are mixed in throughout there they've had some issues with rabbits coming and trimming stuff up but i really put that in there because i think um a lot of the country that grows hemp can relate to that because that's uh very often what i pull up to if i'm pulling up to a site that is just perfect um that never happens. I'm not. I'm not there if the site's if the site's perfect. I'm usually there because it looks like this and there's some room for improvement. Um, in this particular one, they were putting our um, our tape emitter liner, our drip line underneath the plastic mulch at the base of it, and they were having rabbits come in to look for water in the dry season and chewing through the plastic mulch, chewing into the tape, and they were having to put tape lock fittings in to make the connection repairs all the time. And so I was there to try to kind of formulate a plan on you know, maybe going with a stronger emitter line, um, you know, or a thick walled tubing to put uh, a few inches below the soil uh, so the rodents couldn't dig into it, you know. So, so usually when I'm out there, there's a, there's a, a problem to solve and hopefully a solution. And that was the solution in that instance. Yeah. Bon, it's great that you uh, help set the expectation and not make it uh, unrealistic because uh, you're just thinking about the challenges you were talking about right there. And I think, oh my gosh, you have to, uh, you have to have a lot of fortitude to be a grower. Yeah, you do. Um, you know, and every single one of these growers uh, knows way more about growing the plant than I do. Um, but at the same time, they still, when I go out there, I see their eyes light up because they're still realizing that there's, uh, there's challenges that they weren't ready for. Um, and like I said, hopefully this, this guide kind of highlights some of them from beginning to end. And, you know, it's a good segue into uh, there, there's typically, as you can see on the board, there's typically, uh, you know, general factors you want to consider uh, before you even start growing. Um, and we've listed a bunch of them here. This goes back to the return on investment that we spoke about. Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium are not cheap nutrients. So you want to look at, you know, in your area first, can you buy it? Two, how are you going to distribute it through your irrigation system if you have to? Are there amendments that need to be done to the soil before you even consider? Um, all these things come in, you know, are, are key factors into what we, um, what most hemp growers take into consideration. Uh, they'll meet with designers to design out the layout, you know, just the rows and crops. How many plants am I going to grow per square foot? Um, you know, uh, it, like we were just explaining the thickness of the tubing that you're ultimately going to install for the irrigation process. Um, all these things come into uh, to account. Uh, the acidic level is obviously very crucial um, to the soil base. So we, I wanted to open it up with, you know, the, the general items to consider um, just before you even start to get down to the nuts and bolts of what we're planting, how we're irrigating it, row spacing, things like that. Um, you know, water quality is a big one. What, do, what kind of quality water are we dealing with here? Is this water that we're going to be able to work with? Can we add stuff to it or take stuff out of it to make it work? Um, and then we're, are we going to be able to distribute it to all the plants that need it consistently throughout our grow season? Um, and so that's what this spread kind of does. And then um, I'm a big fan of visuals. And so uh, it always helps when you can see the visual visuals. I wanted to show people, you know, for your root height, uh, excuse me, for your plant height, you're looking at for your a root width. Um, you know, a hemp plant is a is a un unique root for the most part to, to what I'm used to growing from the landscape side is we have a canopy of roots that not only grow very close to the ground, but they also grow down. Um, so there's some, there's some structural integrity that's gained from our root base growing deeper, driving our water deeper, but then there's also, um, you know, advantages to keeping some water close to the surface as well, because, uh, you know, the more oxygen those roots get, the faster the plant grows. And so that's why a lot of growers will dump a lot of water on the surface, stop watering, and then they'll do a deep water later because you're trying to really keep those roots close to the surface as well as deep. Now, one thing I really loved about this illustration, one we hadn't seen before, is just the way the roots span out. You know, it's not completely uniform. There is an arc there, and uh, a lot of other illustrations don't really show that. I really like that one. Yeah, I mean, there there is a tap root, so I mean, you you can you can control the height of it if you wanted to. Um, most hemp plants um, and even cannabis plants don't typically grow above. Uh, you know, I know in Humboldt, there's going to be this argument that people have seen these 15 foot tall cannabis and hemp plants. But um, ideally that, you know, now you're climbing up a ladder to trim it. I mean, that just, it, it, it doesn't really make a lot of sense unless you're trying to grow a lot in a small space. 
And um, I'm sure they could grow corn 15 foot, feet tall too, but they don't because there's ultimately a harvesting and yielding procedure to it. And you're trying to reduce as much liability as possible. And so you don't need your growers and your trimmers climbing up on a ladder to have to trim a, a trophy tree if you don't need them to. Um, and so typically the trees that I see on sites range from anywhere from about, you know, maybe four and a half feet to uh, seven or eight feet at the tallest, but no, no higher than, a, you know, a, a, a plant of corn. Right. Um, so yeah, so hopefully everybody gets a chance to download this. They can they can throw them through throw them, thumb through the different uh, aspects of that illustration. Um, so one of the number one questions that I get from the manufacturing side is, um, let's see, just I'll check on time. So I don't oops, sorry, so I don't ramble on here too much. But I want to get to this is one of the more important things that I do want to cover is um, you know when you're an entry level grower. Uh, I get the question. Um, it's very much like shopping for a car. It's like, well, if I don't want to buy the, the Toyota, what if I did want the Ferrari? And um, a lot of growers kind of go into it. Some have high budgets, high capital, where they can come in and they can create more of a permanent system for a five to 10 year um, plan. Um, some come in from the base, as we talked about, they're trying to do a conversion crop where they're trying to convert some of their property. Um, we were just in Colorado. They were converting potatoes over to hemp uh, and, and they own 1500 acres, but they wanted to convert 40 acres over to hemp first. So in the process, they said, well, what if we don't, we don't know if we want to do this and I can teach the laborers and the workers how to do this properly. Um, so we don't want to invest too much in it. So what we try to do is we try to, um, lay out for them. Here's the low cost, here's the middle price, and here's the commercial uh, version of this. Um, and so it kind of tells you exactly some of the compromises you can make while still providing the crop with what it needs. It just might be more of a short-term plan. And then after two or three years, you can assess it, or even after a few yields, you can assess it. It only takes a few months to grow um, a decent cannabis plant and you know maybe six months to grow a good hemp plant before you can start pulling from it. And so this breaks it down into a tier system. So I have a lot of growers that come to me and say, that, look, I'm, I'm interested in B with maybe a little bit of C. Maybe I want some automation because I don't need um, 40 people out there hand watering things. But at the same time, I don't know that I'm ready to drop a PVC mainline into the ground um, and invest that kind of infrastructure. And so you can kind of mix and match um, you know, certain variables of each one of these packages. And then on the right, the illustration, it gives you the visual for just that. Is typically when we're digging a trench and putting PVC, rigid PVC in the ground and stubbing up, uh, it's a more permanent system. Uh, it allows maintenance to drive around and move over top of it. We're using bigger harvesting trucks and whatnot. So we need it to be more permanent and stable. Um, we can use lay flat, which is, um, you know, in the top right corner, which is A, which is kind of like the hose you see that drains fire hydrants. Um, you know, it's got a, a fabric inseam to it where if you drive over it enough times, you're, you're slowly going to wear it away. And, you know, you're using a clamping system, a system to clamp it onto barbed fittings. Um, and so things can happen, but at the same time, you could also roll it up each season because if it does snow where you're at, or it gets fr freezing, um, you can roll it up. And so it's not as permanent as, uh, some of the other options. And then oval hoses in the middle, which is more of, a um, a flexible rigid PVC, if that makes sense. Um, it's got a thicker wall, you can drive over it, um, you can roll it up, uh, but it's a little pricier because it doesn't have the fabric inseam. It's, a, it's, a, it's made out of PVC. So. Um, so we broke it down and then when it comes to valves, you know, everything needs a valve, a filter and some form of regulation. Um, and, uh, and there's ways to do that as well. You either lay them on the ground or you come up with manifolds like we show um, up in the top left corner of the illustration. But that's one of the main reasons we produced this spread was that was the question from distributors. Well, what if they don't want to go big? They just want to kind of do something to get a buy through a couple of seasons. Um, and that's where this breakdown comes from. Yeah, so I was looking at this, Michael, uh, from the breakdown standpoint, a couple of things that jumped out at me right away. The uh, low cost system or the system A and B medium price are both going to use uh, drip tape and not a midter line, where the uh, commercial level systems probably going to use a midter line. Uh, and then we're going to have uh, on the low cost, probably manual valves up to uh, very uh, automated valves on the uh, commercial level system, automatic valves, and also maybe some technology connected to it, right? Right. Um, I mean, the beauty of tape is you can run it a long ways um, and you, you can get anything from, what do I think we sell six to 15 millimeter, maybe even lower than that. Um, and that's the thickness of the tape. So what it allows you to do is it, it allows you to, uh, 
to work within your price range. You know, how many seasons am I running it for? Am I using, you know, um, some form of uh, tractor to, to lay it out? So I need to be strong. So if it gets stretched, it's not going to break. Um, is it going below the surface on top of the surface? Um, you know, if, am, I, am I in a freeze area or a non-freeze area? So you start to take all your on-site variables into account and, you know, and then that's how you're going to come up with the version of tape. Whereas with emitter line, yes, you can choose your spacing. You can choose, um, we have a couple different emitter types depending on whether or not you need, you know, a check valve or anti-siphon option. But tape is going to give you the flexibility to um, apply water in different spacings while also choosing the thicknesses of the wall um, to fit within, you know, uh, your price range, which is uh, a, a typical product that we use on row crops or very large, um, large applications. And so, um, so it's just an affordable option for some smaller guys while on the big end, you know, you can go with a thicker mill, um, or put it down with a tractor, put it below the surface and get a couple seasons out of it. So um, to me, obviously when you're running giant rows of trees and plants, um, it's a very crucial expense to take into account. Um, as far as the valves go, very similar. Uh, yeah, if you want a ball valve out there and you want someone to have to go and turn on the water every time you need it, uh, then that's a labor expense. There's a liability at workers' comp. There's all these expenses tied to a labor a laborer going out there and turning something on, or do you want to invest in it initially with something um, that we can automate off of a controller um, so it turns on consistently and on schedule and it cycles uh, for the right amount of time every single time. And typically that's when you get a solid canopy of, um, of any plant, but uh, hemp is susceptible as it is to water. Um, I can tell very quickly when I roll up to a site of cannabis and hemp is if they have a consistent canopy across the top, if they're automated or not. So. Yeah, those are the key factors. Okay, great. Um, as I mentioned, one of the one of the very crucial components of this system is tape or emitter line. Um, tape is more flexible, uh, economical version of emitter line. Emitter line is a thicker wall. It's going to last longer. Um, you know, it's going to provide a check valve. Um, items like this, or you know, variables like this. Uh, and so, what we did is one of the main. Uh, one of the main questions I get is how do these products work? Uh, so we illustrated exactly how the water path, the inlet and the outlet exist, how the water comes from inside the tube, works its way through uh, uh, what we call a cascading labyrinth in a lot of our um, emitters and how the water works through, filters out the debris, self flushes itself upon activation and um, allows the debris to push out of the slots or the little outlets that exist. And um, by doing this, you know, uh, if you have an emitter every 24 to 36 inches and your plant's facing, typically in hemp, it's about three feet on center. Um, if you have a couple of emitters get clogged, you're now uh, potentially losing a couple plants or even a couple cycles of watering before you figure out that it's not getting water. Sometimes it's, it can be months. Um, well, those plants, you know, they're valued anywhere from two to $5,000 a piece. So it's not like you're, you're losing a, um, a little, you know, a carrot, you're, you're losing a, a considerable amount of uh, plant and value there. And so you really want to make sure that you eliminate any risk of losing uh, plants because of that value. And so the way we do this is we do it with filtering and flushing. And we'll talk about filtering and flushing in a minute, but it definitely helps when your emission device um, is capable of that itself. And that's exactly what um, some of the technology on this page, uh, you know, spotlights is, is how we're, we're, we're able to move debris through our emitters um, when the water quality is not optimal or when there's been a break in the system and then it's been repaired and maybe not flushed properly. And so you wanna take all these things into account to kind of make it a fail-proof system once it's sealed up. Yeah, so Michael, how do people keep in mind, how do you keep it in your head straight when I should be using uh, Chapin or Cascade, right? It looks like they have the similar emitters. How, how, how do you keep that in mind? Um, well, I think it's a combination of two and uh, the Chapin and the Cascade more on the ag side, the Chapin's gonna have um, like an inlet and you know, we've, uh, I know this mostly from the documentation I've done of them being made. So I can tell you from a manufacturer's perspective, when the when the Chapin tape is made in upstate New York, um, you know, a, as the, the the tubing is coming around um, and being extruded, there's a thin thin layer, almost looks like Scotch tape that has a, a path on it. That path is ingrained into the tubing, and I know Eric's probably watching right now. Go, <laughs> and you're not explaining this properly, but I'm explaining it the best I can. Basically you have this ingrained line of inlet that goes the, the extent of the, the tape. And then it, 
that we poke holes in it afterwards that allow the water so that you have kind of this continuous path along the whole piece of tape where the water comes out of it. Whereas in something like Cascade, you have a designated emitter, very similar to our Amnon or our Top Drip, where it's actually um, you know, a, a separate plastic emitter that's been sonically welded together with a diaphragm inside of it or with the Cascade. I don't know that it has the diaphragm like the Top Drip does, but it's actually a separate emitter. And the same thing is very similar as the hot extruded tubing comes out of the lines. Uh, the emitter is um, you know, uh, welded to the inside or melted to the inside. Melted is probably not the right term. Melted to the inside, and then we have a laser that drills the hole in it. So uh, the biggest difference I see in the tape and then the Cascade Top Drip and Amnon is that there's actual a physical emitter. Um, it's not just a continuous flow path like the, the Chapin tape has it um, ingrained into the seam of it. Yeah. Okay, great. So, that, that really helps. Yeah. Um, yeah, so those are the three differences. And obviously, having the multiple components leads to cost. And so something like Chapin, where you have this continuous process um, in the manufacturing, is going to lead to a reduced amount of cost uh, with an ample amount of, uh, of quality. Um, we broke down exactly how Chapin and Cascade. Here's some, some features, uh, continuous filtering inlets. All right, so I wasn't completely off on Chapin. Um, that's that's essentially how it looks. It is a separate strip that gets um, welded into it or uh, melted into it as it gets pulled off the, the path. Um, the Cascade has a separate emitter. It's a, it's a great, I don't want to say low cost, um, but it, it's a great emitter for the expense. You can buy it and run it in very, very long lengths, um, unlike a lot of our, um, our Amnon emitters, which actually have that diaphragm inside that require a certain amount of pressure and a certain amount of water to open up. Uh, it doesn't have that. And so uh, you get the advantages of the labyrinth path for filtration um, without the expense and the, the necessity for the amount of pressure and water to go into it to open up that separate diaphragm. So Michael, this, uh, this guide here, it really takes uh, anybody who wants to grow step-by-step, uh, page-by-page page, through everything they need to buy in order to have a successful system. Yeah, um, I mean, very much, uh, you know, I explain this to distributors when I do training with them all the time is uh, it's a linear process, you know, moving irrigation in general is even, even if you have branches that T and elbow off of it, ultimately working out from your point of connection outwards through your valve, through your filter, through your regulator, into your emission line path, um, and then out the, the, the flushing path, you know, that's, that's not only the best way to install it and the best way to specify it, that, but to me, that's the best way to support it and try to troubleshoot it. And so typically when I come on a site, like the one with the, the gophers or the rabbits chewing into the tubing, um, they were very, growers are very quick to take you out to where the problem exists. And I constantly start at the pump, like take me to the pump. Let me see what your reservoirs look like. Let me see what your power source is. Uh, you know, how often do you guys, how much time are you guys spending here on site now? You know, and it, it, it's just like going to the doctor and getting your pulse taken. It, you're like, no, I'm here for a cough. Why do you need to know my pulse? But, you know, you're really looking at all those factors that go into the system. And um, I always start at the beginning. I always start at the pump. Um, and I'll admit six or seven years ago, I was a little nervous going on some of these sites because uh, they have very tall fences and very big people running these places. Um, but then you you have to realize that they're there they're there for my um, expertise from front to back. And if I'm there for an hour or two, I'm not there just to tell you, hey, uh, you have a gopher problem that you're already self-aware of, uh, that you need to bury it. I'm going to go look at the beginning source and give them notes from this from the very beginning of the system to the end. And so when I design these guides, I do just that. I start you at the beginning. I let you look at the uh, the key factors, look at your budget, look at your ROI, how much space do you have to grow in? And then here are some of the major expenses to the irrigation that you're going to have to take into account. Um, and one of the most crucial is how are we distributing water in, in a lateral path to the different plants along the way? Um, and so I really wanted to focus on our options and Jane, you know, um, you know, and some of the details that are involved in them, like you asked, and hopefully this puts it on paper and, you know, it's got everything but the prices. You go into your distributor and say, what are the difference in prices here? And these are the factors I need or the features I need. And this is the one I want. Yeah, so um, so now I'm going to ask you to shortcut us. Okay. Um, you've seen a lot of these systems. Um, where, where do you see the most misses? Uh, you know, for instance, if I talk about landscape irrigation, uh, having a um, <clears throat> automatic flush valve at the end of every lateral, you know, that's almost 100% miss for 
for the industry. So, uh, and it's an important one to have. Uh, what are what are the misses? What what should people be doing that you see a lot of people skipping? So um, I'm skipping through a couple of things here because I feel like I might have already kind of covered it. And this is kind of um, I don't want to read through this verbatim. And then to your point, um, the two things. The main one is this one right here is filtration. Um, I think that there's a lot of misconceptions in filtering your water. Um, you know, you, you're not only um, the for the outdoor hemp guides guys. They're um, you know they're pulling typically water from a well or from a, a, a public municipality or utility, and um, you're under the impression if you haven't had a water test that it's just it, it, it's unconsciously perfect. Like there's nothing wrong with it. There can't be any debris in it. And very quickly as you start to make connections, you realize that that's not the case. And as I mentioned, the, the you cannot have clogged emitters in these in these um, harvests. And so. Um, filtering is the big one. I always over, I o try to over explain filtration, not to mention because you're a lot of guys use reservoirs for their mixing. So when you have a 2,500 gallon tank in the middle of a field and you're pouring a bunch of nutrients um, and additives into it, and then you're just mixing it like you would paint, and then you're just letting it run for a week and a half, you're just, you're, you're raising the very quickly bad things are going to happen. And so you've got to plan for that. You've got to plan not only for consistency, but for, um, you know, your inconsistencies. And the big one is that one, when the, you're pulling from a water source that is, is typically inconsistent with the hemp guys outside indoors, it's a little easier. You don't have the UV aspect of it. Um, it's usually air conditioned. So you don't have a problem with the guy standing over it with a wand mixing it, but outdoors on the hemp projects, um, I think a lot of people just dump their nutrients into these 2,500 gallon tanks. And then they're under the impression that as they drive away throughout the week, everything will be watered equally. And that just never happens. And so the biggest one is avoiding, because we don't sell nutrients, we do sell fertigation. Um, but because we don't sell nutrients from, a, from an irrigation standpoint, I always focus on filtering and flushing. And if you can filter your water coming out of your tanks at your master valve or at your point of connection, and then also at the individual station levels or the hydrozone levels, um, you're just one step ahead. It also gives you a flush point. It gives you a place to drain during freeze. Um, your, your water, you know, is going to be clean coming from your reservoir into the zone. And then if you're flushing every time automatically, um, if it's a big system, you're doing auto flushes through a controller. Um, if it's a smaller system, you're using something like this, this, these little devices. We have an air vent here, and then we have a, a flush um, valve. Uh, it's just allowing that any debris that did make it through the filter or if the filter hasn't been maintenance to uh, manage properly, it's going to allow you to push a little bit of debris out of the ends. And that's going to um, eliminate the, you know, the potential of getting things clogged, which is the biggest one. Um, the other confusion is just right there, screen filters and disc filters. Um, I think disc filters, because they were more expensive, a lot of the hemp and cannabis guys assume that they worked better. But there is a, um, there is a specific, specific application for both of these. Um, I always tell, you know, but any kind of filter needs cleaning. That's why it exists. Um, and a screen filter can be very, very difficult to get algae and, um, you know, more natural, um, you know, problems off of natural, you know, algae and uh, lichen, stuff like this, moss. So uh, it's really hard to get it off of there. We're going to have to throw it away. And so disc filters uh, give you the ability to open them up, take them apart, and then uh, clean the discs individually. And so uh, disc filters are ideal for algae. And anytime you're using clear tubing or clear tanks where uh, UV is going to introduce um, some natural uh, challenges to your system, you're going to use a disc filter. Screen filters you're going to use when you're just simply trying to filter out debris, um, you know, chunks of limestone or, uh, you know, just uh, dirt particles, soil particles that maybe made it into the line. So um, so I think I do think there's two different applications for that. But as you can see, there are there are many options. And in the top left corner, I highlight where why our Jane Spin Clean filter is, uh, is, you know, there's a reason we have a patent on that, just like there's a reason other manufacturers have patents on certain things. There is a reason that that patent exists, because it is unlike any other filter where you just don't have a typical Y filter, um, where you're just cramming debris down into the bottom of a basin, hoping that you're going to flush it. The spin clean actually creates a vortex that sticks the, the, de the debris to the side. Um, and so every cycle it's running, it's not just stopping it and then reclogging the lines, um, which is also a reason you need flush valves. And so when I walk on a site, the, the, the main thing I look at is how they're filtering and flushing. Then we start to look at the automation aspect of valves. Um, and then we start to look at the actual tape and um, tubing and um, how the water is actually being emitted because um, that's the least of my concerns if the water is dirty. Yeah. 
Well, you know, this is so true anywhere, right? I'm glad you picked filtration. Uh, it's, uh, it's an issue, I think, for most systems. And uh, boy, uh, I remember in the uh, old days, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, I bet you remember on the help desk, uh, people saying, what filter? Have you checked your filter? What filter, right? This was real common. So uh, yeah, regulator, yeah. I mean, regulator is a big one. Um, you know, I think we, we come from, a lot of these conversions when they're, you know, you're converting 5,000 acres of corn over, over to, a, to a smaller hemp, they still think that 150 pounds of pressure is necessary. And a lot of these, you know, the tapes we use and uh, emitter line we use only needs to be about 10 to 25 PSI. Um, and so the combination of filter and pressure regulation is, I think, one of the, the larger voids. But then at the same time, um, we were just on a site and they had um, a disc filter for part of the year and a spin clean filter for the other part of the year, because sometimes they're in, they're in a valley, sometimes they're in the sun, sometimes they're not. So, it, you know, you, you don't always have the perfect, uh, the perfect uh, solution to the problem, which is why all these different, um, you know, solutions exist. And then that's why, you know, people like myself exist to, to run these past and I can always help you make the most educated guess. Which uh, brought me to my next subject, and that is uh, I'm a grower, I'm growing something else, I'm thinking about switching over, I'm going to get started next year, or I'm just going to enter this marketplace next year. How do I get a hold of you for some help? Um, yeah, so uh, I'm sure if you're hot, if you're on here, you can you can email me first initial last name at janesusa.com. Um, when you uh, well, we can put it on a slide at the end of the uh, of, of the webinar. Um, you know, and you can always reach out to me. Uh, hey, one thing that before we go, though, I did want to touch on automation just just very briefly. Um, you know, they, as I mentioned before, the canopy uh, in for indoor cannabis and for outdoor hemp uh, should always be consistent, very much like turf, uh, turf grass is. And the main reason you do that or get that is from consistency and the application of water. And the, it's really hard to do that manually. You can have all your best friends out there watering every day, but even the best managed sites still have inconsistent canopies. And if every one of your plants isn't six feet tall, it's very hard to produce a solid and consistent ROI from year to year. It's hard to purchase your nutrients. Um, consistently, which is where all of a sudden your budget goes up and down, your expenses go up and down every year. And so anytime you can add a, a consistent variable or a constant variable to your site, it's crucial. And one of the main easy ways to do that is to automate it, whether or not you're using a battery powered controller uh, on a consistent schedule, or whether or not you're using something more complex, like a weather-based uh, controller. These are things that you need to take into consideration once your system is. It's a great upgrade to an existing system. It's been three or four years. You got all your best friends out there watering. You know, maybe it's time they spend time trimming and putting it towards, you know, pest control. And you can put a controller on it because I do think second to filtration, I would say automation is another huge void we see in hemp fields. Uh, regardless of size, there's an option for everybody. So you can reach out to me and, uh, and I can help you. We got, a, we got a solution for all of them. Yeah. Well, that's great, Michael. I want to say uh, thank you. This is a wealth of knowledge and a great resource for everybody to, uh, to use this guide. Uh, like I said, I put the uh, link uh, to the guide in the chat. So you can uh, click on that. It'll take you right there. It's downloadable. Uh, and uh, what's really great is it's also free. So uh, yeah. we want everybody to use that and use it well and be successful with it. Um, I want to say thanks everybody for watching. Uh, as you know, all our trainings are on the jamesusa.com website uh, forward slash trainings, or just search it and you'll find it there. Or also uh, anywhere you listen to your favorite podcasts these days, you can find us there. And one thing's for sure is our podcast audience continues to grow rapidly. And that's very encouraging to me to think that uh, people are maybe working the job and still educating themselves. That, uh, that gives me a lot of hope for the future for, uh, for uh, irrigation, agriculture, and landscape. So again, Michael, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And uh, we'll see everybody uh, on uh, Friday. Uh, we're going to have uh, uh, Eric from My Job Depends on Ag uh, talking about uh, what the drought in California is doing to everybody's job since that depends on ag. So thanks again, everybody. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, Michael. Thank you.